Tonight is everything you want to know about COVID and the COVID vaccine. Uh, my name is Dr. Valda Crowder. I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years. Um, and I've treated patients across four pandemics, two category five hurricanes and one mass shooting. Um, these conversations are dated. Um, so today is February 16th. So this is recorded. It's gonna be on my website, which is askdrv.us. So if you actually wanna go back and review anything, it's gonna be there. Um, you can also follow me on askdr underscore v. So let's get going. The structure of the webinar tonight is 20 to 25 minutes of a slide presentation, followed by 30 to 35 minutes of Q&A. All in all, we end right at about nine o'clock. If we go over, we go over. If we end early, we end early. The goal is really just to complete everyone's conversations. During the presentation, everyone is in listen mode. You can use either the chat icon, which is highlighted here, or you can use the Q&A to put your questions in. You are able to put your questions in now. So if you wanna put your questions in now, you know you have questions, you wanna go ahead and upload them, you can. If you wanna watch the presentation and then upload your questions, you can do that as well. Either one is fine. All right, the intention of this webinar is to keep webinar participants informed about COVID-19 science that will help you and your family stay healthy during the pandemic. The outcome is that you'll leave the webinar motivated to create or improve an action plan for yourself or your family, or you'll be motivated to create or improve an action plan for a broader community, maybe a union or a school or a homeowners association um, or a business. So let's get going. All right, here's where we are. Globally, we have 109 million total cases and we have 2.4 million deaths. The United States is 4%, 4% of the US pop, of the worldwide population and we are about 25% of the cases and we're also 25% of the deaths. So we have uniquely not done well with COVID-19. So this graph actually shows what it looks like for us versus other industrialized countries like UK, Germany, Canada, even Mexico and Japan. Um, so um, I'm gonna go over a little bit about what's happening with COVID-19, but I'm gonna also talk about what we should be doing. Um, the CDC recently uh, released new guidelines for the reopening of schools. Um, these guidelines actually fell short on um, very important issues, specifically testing um, and vaccination of teachers, right? So how do you actually determine that you're in a red zone or how do you, where there's a high community transmission rate, or how do you determine that there actually is um, transmission going on in your school that you need to be aware of? Um, and maybe you need to go back to a hybrid model. Um, and then what are you doing around the vaccination of teachers? Europe's oldest person, 116 year old French nun survived COVID-19. And this just goes to show that again, there's some things around COVID-19 that we don't completely understand. It is not as simple as a conversation around the old and the young right? Because there's some older people that are really surviving and there's some young people that are really not. So I would remind people that the jury is still out around which old people do well and which young people do well and which old people don't do well and which young people don't do well. Um, the jury is still out around that. All right. As you guys know, I'm not flying. Everybody asks, why is Dr. B not flying? Um, well, I'm just gonna go over it quickly. This is actually the spreadsheet that has the most important things on it. Um, it has which airlines have masks available, which airlines are mask required, which is all of them. But most importantly, there are some airlines that are not cleaning the planes before every flight, Allegiant, Spirit, and Sun Country. Then there are some 
uh, some airlines that were blocking the middle seats. All of them have started selling the middle seat except for Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines is the only airline that is going to block the middle seat until April 30th. They had originally said until the middle of March, they've extended it. Thank you, Delta Airlines, for being corporate responsible. Um, we really appreciate that. Now, Biden actually put together some sort of um, mandate that allows for medical exemptions and allows people to fly without masks. This is not good at all. Um, and um, again, I, no one on a flight in, a, in an enclosed cabin where you're in the air for hours should be without a mask. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Canada's experience because Canada has a very robust um, public health system that is actually much better than ours. So they're actually able to track a lot of things. So since January 7th, they have um, monitored 70 flights uh, that have had one or more persons on board that have been COVID positive. Now in Canada, they require you to have a negative COVID test 70, uh, th three days before you fly. So even with that requirement, we don't have that requirement. We just do a simple um, screening. Have you had a fever? Have you had a cough? Are you sick? Right, we do a, you know, honesty program. But Canada actually requires you to come with an actual COVID negative test. And even with that, they've had 70 flights since January 7th that have had one or more persons on board that were COVID positive, uh, unbeknownst to them, obviously. Um, and then they have a very rapid system to actually do contract tracing, um, notify all of the people on board to get a, get a COVID test within 48 hours. We are unable to do that in the United States. All right, so I tell people respect COVID-19 is highly contagious. You can actually get it within 45 seconds. If you're talking about the UK variant, which is 70% more contagious, you can get it within 15 seconds. So this is highly, highly, highly contagious. Um, exposure, if you have 100 people that are exposed to it, 60 to 80% become positive. This is different than the flu, which only 30 to 40% become positive. We've talked about this as both droplet and airborne. Droplets are larger, airborne is smaller and travels further, right? So if you talk about airborne, you're talking about tuberculosis, measles. So let's say what it looks like. So it looks like this. This person is COVID positive. Let's say he's talking, um, singing, yelling, screaming. He could be blowing an instrument, right? So all of the things that are in this pathway actually become um, infected. Um, so if it's droplets, it's the red droplets that drop closer to him. If it's actually airborne, then it actually goes a little bit further and that's the gray. Now, how far it goes actually depends upon the temperature and the humidity. So if it's less than 52 degrees, it actually goes further. It hangs in the air longer, which is why you see more of an infection in the winter time. Um, but this is kind of like what it, what it, what it looks like. Um, and there's all sorts of things that could be in this pathway. I didn't get a chance to add the slides to the presentation, but I used to always spray my gas pumps where I actually go pump my gas. Um, and golf, um, golf oil actually put up a sign that said, please do not touch the, the gas tanks without your gloves. So it's very, very important to think about park bench, um, gas tanks, uh, doors, um, um, a lot of things that we uh, normally may interface with. All right, COVID testing. The PCR test is the gold standard. That is the swab that actually goes up your nose. It's most accurate eight days after exposure. It could be negative if it's too soon or too late. Um, antigen testing is the rapid test. Um, it detects proteins on the surface. It tells you that you do not have COVID-19 when you really do 30% of the time. 
So please do not use this test to decide if you're going to actually go meet with loved ones or family or anybody else. If it's positive, it's true. If it's negative, you need another one. CAT scans is another way. Um, this uh, CAT scan actually shows, and I just blow it up a little bit so you can see sort of the whiteness on both sides with the yellow arrows. Um, that actually shows it's very subtle to people who are not used to reading CAT scans, um, but it's not very subtle to us, but that is COVID-19 until proven otherwise. Um, the COVID sniffing dogs are actually extremely accurate. They're almost as accurate and sometimes a little bit more accurate than the PCR test. They are being debuted at the Miami Heat Games. Now, just a little bit about mask. I know there's been a lot of things around should we, what mask should we have. The mask to the upper left-hand side, which is fabric mask, those are about 25, 35% effective. The surgical mask to the right, same thing, 35 to 40. The KN95 and the N95 mask, they're 95% effective when they're properly fit tested. Most people do not have proper fit testing. So without proper fit testing, they're 85 to 95 to 90% effective. Um, and then I use the Spirian half respirator mask, um, which is an N100 mask which blocks out 100% of the particles if I actually go see a COVID positive patient. Um, I wanted to just share it with everyone. And, and, and this was for, um, this was for uh, last week. And so if it's run out by now, I don't know. But this was 100 NIOSH N95 masks that were available with Costco. So this is $2.59 a mask. Um, and I wanted everybody to know you could get it on Costco online. There was some shipping and handling um, discount as well. Um, this is the link. Feel free to take a picture of the, any of these slides. Nothing here is um, uh, uh, proprietary. Um, please feel free to take a picture of it. But these Costco N95 particulate respirator masks were available last week. Um, so I just wanted to share with everyone um, what that looked like. A lot of people have said masks are uncomfortable. I just want to give them a reality check. This is what it looks like when you actually put someone on, when I actually put someone on a ventilator. So when I actually put someone on a ventilator, I put this metal instrument um, that you see down their throat, past the back of their, their tongue. Um, I normally actually uh, put them in a coma um, and do this and then pass a tube that goes all the way down past their vocal cords. So as much as the mask may be uncomfortable, a ventilator is more uncomfortable. Let's talk about the symptoms associated with COVID-19. Most of the symptoms are preceded by loss of smell, loss of taste, or loss of appetite about 50 or 60% of the time. Some people never have that. As far as fevers, about 70, maybe 75% of the time. Some people, again, never have that. So there's a category of people who have COVID-19 who are completely asymptomatic. So in addition to the asymptomatic people, you have cluster one, which is flu-like with no fever, cluster two, which is flu-like with a fever, and cluster three, the, who have vomiting and diarrhea. All of these actually normally do well at home, and don't require hospitalization. Cluster four, five, and six are the ones that actually require hospitalization, ICU, and sometimes die. These are patients that experience fatigue, confusion, or a combination of abdominal and respiratory symptoms together. So it's very, very important if you have any symptoms with COVID that you actually seek out treatment. So another thing is that there's something called COVID toes, which is a reddish bluish discoloration of the extremities. You normally see it in, in kids, but you can also see it in young people. I've seen it as someone, as, as, uh, with someone as old as 55 years old. Um, and you might think maybe I, my, my toes are frostbitten, maybe they're cold because of the weather, maybe my shoes are tight, um, but this is COVID-19 until proven otherwise. 
So let's talk about patient outcomes. There's basically four pathways. So pathway one is someone who catches COVID, they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, and they completely recover and they never ever develop symptoms again. Best scenario. Pathway two is I catch COVID, I'm asymptomatic or symptomatic, I recover, and then I have symptoms even though I recovered later on, and those are called long haulers. Think about um, the player with the Florida Gators who actually um, passed out as he was uh, dribbling the ball during a game. Um, some of them can have neurologic symptoms. Um, some of them can have problems with their balance, those sorts of things, numbness, tingling, very odd things. Then there's pe people who actually catch COVID and then five months later, they catch it again. So that's called a reinfection. And then the fourth category is people who catch COVID, become seriously ill, and have a long-term condition that takes them a year or two to recover. Usually we call that post-ICU syndrome. So post-ICU syndrome, those patients, 75% of them have a cognitive, mental, or physical impairment that they have to recover from. Uh, many of them have um, kidney failure and require dialysis or actually a kidney transplant. Some have limb amputations as a result of clotting. Some of them also have a stroke. 50% of the young people who have a stroke are not able to return to work. About a third of them have fibrosis and decreased lung capacity and have difficulty actually going back to normal activity like walking a block, cleaning a house, et cetera. All right, so researchers found that there's a higher level concentration of coronavirus in the brains of mice than in the lungs. And this is what I tell people, this is a multi-system disease. This is not a respiratory disease. So as we look at the flu versus COVID, the flu, we normally have 40 up to a maximum of about 45 million people in a year. COVID, we have 26 million people in a year. So we have fewer people who catch COVID, but we have a higher death rate. So with the flu, we normally only have about at the highest 90, 95,000 people dead. With coronavirus, we're up around 441,000 people dead. Probably by next week, we will be at half a million people dead in the United States as a result of COVID-19. COVID-19 is distinct, it is so contagious that we've had to shut down all elective procedures in the United States. That has never been done in my 30 year profession. 100% of the beds in some hospitals in the ICU are COVID patients. I've never seen that in my 30 year profession. Again, it's a multi-system disease, renal failure, myositis, which involves the heart, strokes, and blood clots in the limbs. Some people recovering require a double lung transplant. In the ICU, we are sometimes unable to actually oxygenate people on a ventilator and we're, we are required to put them on ECMO. And I will talk a little bit later about what is ECMO. So let's say you are joining our webinar for the first time and you just found out you're COVID positive. We would prefer that you actually quarantine for 21 days. 14 days is what the CDC asked for, um, but about 6% of the people are still positive. So if you quarantine only for 14 days, my request would be that you actually get tested to be sure that you're negative. So if you can't get tested, preferably 21 days. All right, so what do we want you to do? One, buy a pulse ox. This is what it looks like over here to the right. The number 97 should be 95 or above. If that number is less than 95, you actually need to go in and get treatment if you're a healthy person. If you're elderly or you're a smoker, you should talk to your doctor about what is the right number for you. But if you're a healthy person, um, you know, you know, zero to 65 years old or 70 years old and you, um, you know, grocery shop and exercise a couple times a week, it should be 95 or above. Zinc and vitamin D3, I am actually recommending that anybody in the sound of my voice gets on it now. Zinc and vitamin D3, particularly vitamin D3 since the sun is down um, because D3 is very sun related. 
Um, and so um, you want to actually get these supplements in your body now before you get COVID or possibly get COVID positive. This is a time during this pandemic to make sure you have an adequate amount of zinc and vitamin D3 in your system. You never know when something would happen. You want to have a bathroom that you only can access. You want to have your cell phone where you can call 911, not a family member because you're not going to get a family member sick. You want to leave food at a closed door. Open up your windows because ventilation matters, right? The air kind of mixing actually dissipates everything. And if you're able to put a HEPA filter in your HVA system, that would be important. Or the highest level of filter that you can actually find at your normal um, store for um, for those sorts of filters. Let's talk about treatment plan. We talked about oxygen that you need if you're 95 percent or less, vitamin D, zinc. I'm going to talk about famotidine which everybody knows what famotidine is, you'll see dexamethasone, antibodies, and ECMO. Famotidine, Pepsid AC. Famotidine is Pepsid AC. Well, doc, I don't have a stomach problem. No, you don't have a stomach problem. Famotidine, Pepsid AC actually blocks histamine. We actually use this even in allergic reactions. Let's say somebody had a bee sting or a peanut allergy, right? We would use famotidine right? Even though they don't have a stomach problem. COVID is an inflammatory disease. So think about it in the same way you think about any sort of inflammation. So famotidine lowers the hospital deaths and it lowers combined outcome death and intubation. Have this in your house during the pandemic. If you become COVID positive, start taking it. Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a steroid. This can only be given in the hospital. It lowers the 28-day death rate for those people that require oxygen or a ventilator. Now, Regeneron is the name of the company, not the name of the not the name of the medication. The other company that also actually does this is Eli Lilly. So Regeneron and Eli Lilly have antibody cocktail. It's two antibodies directed at key proteins in the surface of the virus. One comes from a human that recovered from COVID-19. The second one comes from a, a mouse that was engineered to have a human-like immune system. It actually binds to the main surface protein and actually prevents it actually from getting into the cell. This just shows Eli Lilly's antibody treatment protocol. It was FDA approved back in November 10th. And it looks like uh, Ben Carson, as well as a number of people in the Trump administration who actually became COVID positive, actually got this antibody treatment. So where do you get that antibody treatment? Well, you kind of have to know where is the nearest infusion center. And a lot of people, when I ask them, they go, well, I, if I got positive, I, I don't know where I would go. This is part of your actual uh, plan. This is part of your COVID plan. You want to know where would you go? So wherever you are, that you're listening to my voice right now, you need to begin picking up the phone and asking your local hospital, do you have the COVID antibodies? Do you have infusion centers? Find out where they are. Now, let me tell you the criteria. If you're over 65, you automatically get the antibodies if you begin to have symptoms. If you're 12 to 64, you're going to have a BMI over 35, which is about 30 to 40 pounds overweight, diabetes, immunosuppressive disease, renal disease, diabetes, you can have type 1 or type 2. The main thing that's important is you must, must, must have gotten onset of symptoms within the last 10 days. Now I can tell you where I work actually just shortened that to nine days. So do not stay home with symptoms, wondering what to do. Find an infusion center fast. If you get antibody infusions, they decrease the likelihood of you being hospitalized by 70%. So they make a huge, huge difference. All right, what about ECMO? ECMO is one of those things like you don't really want it, but I'm gonna show you what it is. So ECMO means outside of the body, membrane oxygenation. So this is when you fail 
ICU ventilation with a ventilator, right? So ECMO is they open up your chest, they cannulate the vein coming into your heart, and they cannulate the artery going out of your heart, and they take the blood out and they put it in the machine to the right. They oxygenate your blood and they send it back. They only do this procedure for very, very young people who um, are failing the ventilator with COVID-19. So this is not done for an 80 or 90 year old person. And even people who they do it for that are younger come out and have a lot of problems and usually need a double lung transplant. So let's talk just a couple of things. Um, the UK did a study and they said, so we know that immunity lasts for 90 days. They say immunity might last up to five months. So if you recently got COVID-19, then you can wait 90 days to five months to get vaccinated. This just shows two people who got COVID-19 twice. The woman to the left was 102, she survived. The young gentleman to the right was 18 years old. The second time he got it, he actually died. So this is what I'm saying to everyone. There's more, there's more to this than meets the eye. Um, we haven't figured out why some people get it and they get it very seriously and other people do not. We just have not figured that out. All right, so let's talk about the vaccines because that's where all the action's at. So I first want to talk about how does COVID-19 work? So. The viral RNA, this COVID-19, is inside of the molecule. It's covered by the orange fatty molecule, which has spike proteins. The spike protein actually um, connects with the receptor protein, and that, that is what actually allows it to enter the cell. Once it enters the cell, it begins to replicate. During the replication process is when the virus can become more efficient it can actually create, it creates the variants. The more it replicates, the more it actually creates the variants. So if you think about it, there's 70 trillion cells in one body for it to actually get into. So if it gets into one body and it creates a lot of different uh, molecules, it can create variants, it can create a lot of different things to make it more efficient. So once it actually creates the protein, it also creates the fatty cells that go, um, that go on the outside, and then it reformulates and it goes out and it affects another cell and it does this over and over and over again, really, really quickly, so that it's quickly all over your body. And that's actually how COVID-19 actually becomes a multi-system disease. So Moderna and Pfizer, both work similarly and that they are a messenger RNA approach. So they code for the spike protein. When you get vaccinated, you produce a spike protein, a portion of it, your body recognizes it as foreign, develops antibodies, attacks and kills it. And then when you see that spike protein in the community, you actually attack and kill it and you actually do not get sick from COVID-19. Now, this is important. Are you infected with COVID-19? Yes. Are you symptomatic with COVID-19? No. And this is why people who get the vaccine still must wear a mask, particularly if they're around other people who have not been vaccinated. Johnson & Johnson similarly is what we call the viral vector approach. They use the adenovirus, which is a common cold, alter it and make it harmless, and then connect genetic material from COVID-19. That combination teaches the body to generate antibodies and they generate antibodies to attack the spike protein so that the virus cannot actually get into your cell. So you're infected with COVID-19, but COVID-19 is harmless. So I just wanted to show a couple of the actual um, uh, studies that we have going on right now. Johnson & Johnson, I think, will actually get emergency use authorization probably within the next two weeks, probably by the 1st of March. 72, 66, and 57. 72 is the effectiveness in the U.S., 66 is Latin America, and 57% is in South Africa when the South African variant was occurring. Pfizer and Moderna 
did not actually test during the UK or the South African variant surge. Um, there are other studies going on with a lot of different, there's a Janssen study, there's a lot of other different studies, but I wanted to show you the information from um, the, the main five. People ask me what's in the vaccine. I wanted to show you guys what is in it. This is what is listed as the FDA as the ingredient. Again, if you want to take a photo of this slide, you can. All right, I got a lot of questions about ethylene glycol. Is ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze in the vaccine, no. What's in the vaccine is polyethylene glycol. And that is also commonly found in lotions, creams, and toothpaste. Um, it's actually used in vaccines because it helps the medication evade the immune system and stay in circulation longer. Now, I had some questions about immune thrombocytopenia. These were questions that were sent to me. I want to remind people, if you have articles that you want me to read, or you have some questions or concerns, please send them to me. So these slides are actually a result of that. Immune thrombocytopenia is something that can occur from any vaccine. So I want to go over what actually it is. Thrombocytopenia is a decrease in the number of platelets which are used for clotting. Immune thrombocytopenia can be asymptomatic or it can be symptomatic. So if it's symptomatic, it can be associated with a rash or bruising, or it can be associated with bleeding problems. So the CDC right now has a vaccine surveillance program where they contact people randomly who have actually received the vaccine. They have detected 36 cases of immune thrombocytopenia out of 31 million vaccines that were administered. The data is still um, being determined around how many of these were associated with the vaccines and how many were naturally occurring in the community. But if you see something around immune thrombocytopenia, you know what it is. It's decreased platelets. Um, it can be asymptomatic. It can be associated with a rash or it can be associated with bleeding problems. They did have one person who actually had a bleed into her head and died out of the 36 people. So I actually want to make sure that people actually know what this is and what to actually look for. So I get a lot of questions around the COVID vaccine was developed too quickly, too quickly, too quickly, 11 months. That's not true. SARS started in November 16, 2002. SARS is caused by SARS-CoV. The SARS infection resulted in 8,500 cases, 800 deaths across 33, 33 countries. The vaccine development started very quickly in 2003. I show you this article and I referenced this. This is on my website. This is from 2005. In this 2005, they talk about having a viral vector approach and a messenger RNA approach that will actually lead to a vaccine for SARS-CoV, which is SARS, not COVID-19, okay? Now, SARS and COVID-19 are very similar. They actually share 80% of their DNA and both of them cause a severe respiratory sim symptoms and both of them use the spike protein. So the COVID vaccine are, are, are a result of the SARS research that started in 2003. These are not new. We've been working on them for a very long time. I would love to say, oh my gosh, we, we actually created these vaccines in 11 months. No, we did not. And the messenger RNA has also been used for um, probably 20 years um, with oncology treatments or cancer treatments. Now, there was a framework for equitable allocations of vaccines. We're not using it. The CDC says anybody over 65 should get vaccinated and all of the states are doing something different. So I know you guys have reached out to me and asked me about this. I'm gonna share information that I can, but know that every state is different. So in DC, they have prioritized patients that are overweight because patients that are overweight actually uh, do not do as well with COVID-19. So DC actually, and even Pennsylvania, have actually prioritized people 
based upon their BMI, which is your body mass index. So if you are in those states, that is very important. And you need to, when you try to make an appointment, let people know what your BMI is. Now, mutations. Mutations. We are not able to do thorough genomic surveillance. <clears throat> we are able to do very limited genomic testing. Part of the $1.9 trillion that Biden is actually going after actually includes a more thorough genomic surveillance testing system. There's a lot of variants. There's these four. Now we have actually discovered several US variants in addition to this list. The UK is 70% more efficient in entering the cells. South African variant is actually very dangerous to children. So it is very, very important in our conversation around going back to school that people keep their kids out of school unless the school is doing very, very robust testing and all the teachers have actually been vaccinated. Otherwise, do not send your kids to school. Um, then there's variant, there's a Brazilian and a California variant. And now I'm actually got uh, emails today about multiple US variants. So it's important that you actually clamp down on an infection fast. We did not do that because once you don't do that, it actually allows for all of these variants. We've distributed um, 71 million vaccines. We've administered, put in their arms, 55 million vaccines. So we're about one sixth of the way. If you wanna see where are the um, states that have done the best vaccinations per 100,000 citizens, um, the darker colors have actually done the best. Um, and then to the right, it tells you what percentage of Moderna and what percentage of Pfizer. It's roughly about 50-50. Um, people ask me, should I get Pfizer? Or should I get Moderna? Get the quickest one you can get. The quickest one you can get is the best one. So how do I get a vaccine now? One, you have to be over 65. Some areas are actually doing less than 65, particularly if a refrigerator breaks down or something happens. Um, contact your public health department. Um, when you go to the public health department website, put in COVID vaccine and look for instructions to schedule your vaccine. So I wanna show some screenshots because I want us to be really clear how to do this. So this is what it looks like for Maryland. This is the Maryland vaccine locator site. I actually asked for people to actually tell me where they're from. So I actually put the actual location and the websites up for the places that told me, the, the people that told me this is where they're from. California, uh, this is where California is, myturn.ca.gov. So this is where you actually load up your name and load it up over and over and over again. Now, the other thing that just happened in the last couple of days, it literally started on Sunday, which is why I'm so upset about um, everything that happened with the webinar on Thursday, because I wanted everybody to get uh, signed up for this, but they have started to send it to retail pharmacies and the retail pharmacies started administering doses Sunday, last Sunday. So who are they? Walgreens, this is their site. This is where you actually go in you can take a screenshot of this. This is their landing page. This is where you actually go in, upload all your information. I tell people you want to upload it at multiple sites. I don't have a particular preference for Walgreens, which is why I added CVS. So here are the sites for CVS. States in red are the states the CVS is currently actually doing appointments for the COVID vaccine. So if you don't see your state highlighted, they're not doing your state right now and don't even bother. But check back and see, has your state been added? So if, if CVS is doing your state, put your name in on the CVS site. Now, the Biden administration has also reached out to Amazon about how Amazon can actually help with their distribution network around COVID-19 rollout. Just some photos of some folks who got vaccinated, please make sure to send me your photo so I can add it to the collage. Now, this is interesting. Israel has done 
the best job of vaccinating its adult population. They are now at the point where they've vaccinated almost 60, 70% of their adult, vaccine, uh, adult population. Um, and what they found now is 97% of their COVID-19 deaths are people who were not vaccinated. So they are actually showing what actually happens with vaccination. World Health Organization, again, they're telling us this will not be the last pandemic. Um, let's make sure we figure out the best practices from this one so we can actually prepare for the future.